Hello. Oh, we're on. Um, it seems a little strange using a mic, but um, I think because we're recording the program, uh, we're going to ask everyone to use the mic. So I'll start by setting a good example. <laughs> um, I'm Mary Cerruti. I'm the uh, executive director and chief curator here at Sculpture Center. Um, I would like to welcome everyone here this evening um, for this SC conversation on the occasion of Leslie Hewitt's exhibition, Collective Stance. Um, hopefully you've all had the opportunity to see the exhibition now. Um, I should also mention that there is a, another exhibition on the lower level called Fantasy Can Invent Nothing New, which is our annual in practice uh, exhibition that's called From an Open Call. Um, that call for proposals ends at midnight tonight. So after this, <laughs> you will have about three and a half hours to get your proposal in. <laughs> um, <laughs> And we welcome you to do so. Um, but back to tonight. <laughs> um, I guess I would start by saying that we are extremely excited to um, host this exhibition here at Sculpture Center. Um, I first met Leslie Hewitt, I think in 2004, um, and included her in a survey exhibition um, called Make It Now, New Sculpture in New York, which was uh, on view in 2005. Um, and I have followed her work ever since. And um, we've stayed in sort of loose contact. Leslie generously did a, a limited edition print for a portfolio we did in 2010. And then um, about two years ago, we sort of renewed a more engaged conversation, which led to this exhibition. Um, and I think very quickly in those conversations with Leslie, um, we knew that we wanted to show Untitled Structures which is a work that, although it had been completed in 2012 and had been shown in Houston and Des Moines and Chicago, and I think in Sweden, Norway, um, it had not yet been seen in New York. And it seemed to be such an important piece, not just for Leslie um, in her body of work, but um, for people to actually see. I think um, uh, I, the work is really ravishing. I continue to spend time in it. and. Um, it gives me more and more every time I, I'm in it. <laughs> um, there's just, there's many um, layers and complexities to it. It's a very nuanced work. Um, so if you haven't really spent some time in it, I, I, I'm going to reiterate that I think you should. <laughs> and it'll be on view um, after the conversation. Uh, so as far as introductions, I know that um, we had them on the website and you know, you're all here because you know something about <laughs> who our presenters are. But I want to, um, they're really pretty um, impressive uh, bios, I think, in terms of what uh, these two people have done. Leslie, um, is, you know, was born in, she's a native New Yorker. Um, she went to the Cooper Union School and, to the, and got her MFA at Yale. Um, she, when she was at Cooper Union, she studied Africana and Cultural Studies. Um, recently, she's had solo exhibitions at um, the Manil Collection, the Des Moines Arts Center, MCA Chicago, uh, Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis. Uh, she's been in many important group exhibitions, including the 2008 Whitney Biennial, um, the, I believe it was the 2011 installment of New Photography at MoMA, um, she had a solo exhibition at the Kitchen in 2010, um, and most recently she was in uh, the Photopoetics exhibition at the Guggenheim. Um, so we're extremely proud to have Leslie here at Sculpture Center. Uh, Leah Meisterlin, I'm going to read this one a little bit better because I don't, I'm not as familiar with the resume. Um, I only became familiar with Le Leah's work through Leslie's introduction, which I'm very grateful for because it's fascinating work, which you'll get a glimpse of, I think, tonight. Um, Leah is an urbanist, an architect, and a planner, a data alchemist, a term I love, a, a, a GIS methodologist, and an educator. She's currently CEO and co-founder of Office MG and a term assistant professor of architecture at Barnard and Columbia. Her research is primarily focused on concurrent issues of spatial justice informational ethics and the effects of infrastructural networks on the construction of social and political space, specializing in novel approaches to spatial systems research. Previously, Leah was the director of research at Special Project Office and co-founded 
pre-office or PRE? Pre-office. A design and research studio that investigated the organizational structures behind design processes in the wake of the U.S. foreclosure crisis. Additionally, Meisterlin has held research positions at Columbia University's Teppel Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture and NYU's Center for Latino, Adolescent, and Family Health. Her work has been featured in print in an exhibition including Foreclosed, Rehousing the American Dream at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And she holds a Master of Degree, a Master's of Architecture and an MS in Urban Planning, both from Columbia, and a BA in Art, Architecture and Urbanism from Smith College. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie and Leah. Thank you for that generous introduction and also I'm so happy to see so many people here on a rather warm um, Wednesday. But I'm also happy on the occasion of the show to have the opportunity to speak, to speak with publicly someone who I respect greatly um, and respect her thought processes and the work that she's doing. And um, the impetus for our public discussion was also to reveal to some degree how the conversation <laughs> was structured. Um, and I want to say that it's not planned in a way that this is rehearsed, but we did think of a structure, a structure to begin a conversation um, and to begin perhaps paralleling conversations uh, around concerns of space, sight, um, the political that reverberates from those two words even, um, and the histories that inform our being in the world. Um, I also consider our connection to be generational. And that's also what frames my connection to Bradford Young. Um, so it, it's to me more important that a generation also speak to concerns that um, shape the world. And so we set up the condition of creating a series of images um, that I put together four images and then Leah responded to those images with image. And the only conversation that we had was trying to put together diptychs that made sense, but made sense via the image first. So the image is speaking. And we thought that we would, through this public conversation, speak to our rationale, our attraction to the image, how the image makes sense to our thought processes, et cetera. And in a way, as an invitation to start a conversation publicly. Do you have anything else to, to add? Did I miss anything? In Thank you so much okay. for this invitation <laughs> to the Sculpture Center and to you. The show looks amazing. And um, I'm just really excited. This is, it's been a really fun and interesting exercise to put together what we think is the basis for a conversation, mm -hmm. images in conversation, but not actually talking or telling each other yet what we were thinking when we chose those images. Mm -hmm. And I should also say all within the frame of the show. Right. So I'm personally not going to refer at all to the exhibition. The exhibition is here. And um, maybe it'll come through in the later discussion and op um, when it opens up to everyone else that we can make a counterpoint. Yeah, you'll see very quickly, it's probably, I mean, I'm not spoiling anything by saying it, that none of the images are our own. We, we are both image makers, but we have not chosen any images that we have made uh, for this. Yes. OK, so we begin. Um. So I started by saying that a generational approach was crucial um, to this talk, and I still believe that that is the case. And one of the aspects of that for me is the way in which images shape the way that we think um, and shape the way that we um, see the past, encode images with meaning um, based off of the present tense. We don't always, we're not always hyper aware that we do that, but we do do that. Um, I was attracted to this image because it is of an era that I didn't participate in, um, right, in a way. <laughs> was I there, 1964? Um, but it shaped me 
And it shaped me in ways that I think are still uh, viscerally present. Um, and I, hence, I think this is also my attraction to all art forms made mid 20th century, being a late 20th century being. And really thinking about the way in which images um, inscribe and also hold trauma, maybe a hard word to ev evoke here, um, and how in a way images specifically of the turmoil of the what we could call the civil rights era became and still are extremely fascinating to me um, because they represent an, a kind of after image. And I think that after image still echoes today. So even though this image is a, a documentation of af like the after effect of a riot, specifically in Philadelphia um, in 1964, but um, this kind of like picking up the pieces is a constant. Um, it's a constant uh, struggle, it's a constant act that I feel somehow responsible for. Um, and when I look at this image, I think about um, a few things and I wanted to uh, quote <laughs> um, Arjun Apadurai um, in his book, Modernity at Large, Cultural Dimensions of Globalization. Um, and he quote, I'm quoting him here, as with um, mediation, so with motion, the story of mass migrations, voluntary and force, forced, is hardly a new feature of human history. But when it is juxtaposed with the rapid flow of mass mediated images, scripts, and sensations, we have a new order of instability in the production of modern subjectivities. So when I look at images from this particular era, I think about the beginning of my subjectivity, the formation of the way in which I see the world starts in this kind of rupture. And that's not to kind of romanticize it at all, um, but more so to think about it as a way of seeing. And I approach all of my work through this rubric or through this kind of um, inquiry. And so when I look at this image and I have to continue to look at it because it's so incredibly bizarre in one instance, right? It could be completely staged or one could imagine that in the world that we live in now, right? That this something like this could e is easily repurposed, easily structured. It almost looks like a, a film set in and of itself. The lights that are kind of hovering on the um, uh, fire uh, truck um, and the smoldering wood that's on, really in the foreground of the image, and the smoke that's kind of um, moving up into the, in a, in a way creating a verticality in this image um, that also has like an extremely strong perspectival pull. But the front end of the image is what is always so jarring and attractive to me, um, primarily because I, I, when I look at an image like this as someone who's the late 20th century being, I also look for what isn't possibly representable through a photographic image. And so then I start to dig into the image somehow, um, wanting to invite, in a way, um, a kind of play. And I know that's a bizarre word, word also to bring up in regards to an image whose history we still feel in the present tense. But imagining, um, what each material, if each material could speak, right? So the kind of smoldering wood or this kind of um, structured structure that is literally um, kind of building in the foreground of this image. Um, what, what is the narrative that's implied through that? Um, less so what the image has documented um, is what is fascinating to me um, in this instance. So invisibility is, is at play and also the intersection of reality and invention, which I think is very real. Boy, howdy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm astonished at how many things you just said <laughs> that I want, not only is that true, but I'm also astonished at how many of them are directly applicable to an image that is seemingly not related at all. <laughs> um, okay, uh, 
Because its detail is slightly smaller, I will give a little bit of a preface or tell you what you're looking at if you can't make it out. Um, it is a 1960, well, it represents the year 1960, so I'm assuming it was made, it's circa 1960, 1961, shall we say. Um, it is a map made by the US Army of Engineers, and by map, I mean more like a spatialized infographic that doesn't directly follow the the terrain, right, or the, the sort of latitude and longitude coordinates of what's, what it describes. It shows the, um, its title is Inland Freight Tonnage by Direction of Movement on the Mississippi River and Selected Tributaries and the Gulf Intracoast Intracoastal Waterway, calendar year 1960, right? So it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an infographic, it's a data-driven map, somewhat distorted. Um, after that, where to start? I also, so as, as a little bit of a background, um, I think my, my bio said most of it pretty clearly, but in my work, um, I tend, I work a lot with maps um, and do a, gr a great deal of cartographic analysis. Um, and I think it's, it's fair to say that I kind I believe that there's an, um, the mapped artifacts allow a bit of archaeology into um, the spaces both uh, perceived and conceived and, and space as it was lived or how it was constructed um, in a given time period. I think that the map also speaks as an image, um, as an artifact, uh, operates and exists at the sort of intersection of any society's sort of maximal techno technological advances at a given time. It's, um, it's relationship and understanding of, of scale, how, how different elements within that society interrelate to one another and how parts fit together within a whole, where when each of us contribute something uh, to that society being described, um, and the spatial practices and social practices being described within that map. Um, so technologies, scale, and then, because you can't get away from it, power. Right, um, and uh, this in, this particular map, um, not only because of its time period in which it was made and the area, the region of the country that it represents, um, but I think it starts to speak to, um, and, then, and also its authorship. I, I should make that note, right? It was it's made, like I said, by the Army Corps of Engineers, and it describes, I think, pretty um, straightforwardly not only an infrastructure, a public infrastructure, but also its usage, its exploitation, and the, the landscape of opportunity it, um, it can creates uh, for some places over others, right? It's a direct representation of what uh, we collectively as a, as a public will invest in um, what is effectively individual and private growth. Um, and it sort of reminds us that those infrastructures are not even. They're distributive and redistributive, um, but they are not undifferentiated, right? They're, they, um, they have agendas, they set priorities, um, and, uh, and these, and I think I'm gonna start to echo now, um, right? So th there's, there's the drawings and there are the images that, that show the plans to construct that sort of infrastructure to um, start to funnel and move. And we can, if you want to, we can talk about um, narratives of material. And some of these images start to regionally describe and then you can start to sort of zoom in and understand the different urbanistic qualities that are produced by these sort of flows. But there are certainly embedded um, narratives of material movement that ultimately influence our private experiences and our, our individual experiences because of um, the socioeconomic landscape that they, they, they lay the groundwork for, right? Um, and I, I, I really can't see, it's very difficult, um, or rather it's not difficult. I just don't think it, they should be separated, right? This, uh, the experience as we live it in, in a city or on the street and that, that level of kind of public day-to-dayness um, from the, the structures that, that produce them or contribute to them greatly, we'll say. And I'll, I'll stop from there. We can go to the next one. And so I, I get to start this one. I'm also staying on the right. You can also tell because it's a map. Um, <laughs> 
So I'm just going to keep going on that exact same train of thought. Um, if you're not familiar with it, is anybody not familiar with this map or a map like maybe not of the Bronx before? Um, this is this, this is what's called the redlining maps, a redlining map of um, of the Bronx. It's uh, 19. It's dated the first of April, 1938. Um, the redlining maps are those that were made by the um, Homeowners Loan Corporation, uh, and they were assessed um, mortgage lending risk. So uh, the green areas were places where it was very safe for a bank to lend money to for a mortgage. Go, that's an affluent and I promise you white neighborhood um, with stable property values, and uh, it goes that's green, that goes green, blue, yellow, red, in that order. Um, to uh, Essentially, this is a map, um, unlike the last one, which was sort of an infographic of what flows are produced because of investments made. This, these are the maps that are drawn that before investments are made. Um, and they set in motion regardless, and I, I wanted to talk about it because I think what these practices um, in the early part of the 20th century set into motion, um, like they not only do they still carry legacies visible in the built environment and experiential um, today, but they did so um, despite the, for many, the best of intentions, right? That, the, that these, um, that research was done these map, that data was compiled, these maps were drawn, and because each image must abstract in one way or another, it can't represent everything, it chooses what it's going to show and how it's going to reduce very complex situations, right? Um, that, that nuance of the instrument, and these were intended as decision-making instruments, gets lost, and their intention was ultimately at the at the very very zoomed out federal government level the, it, it was intended to identify areas that needed additional investment right but we all know that like all of the things we invent and create these images um, as well as any other kind of technology if we think of the map as a technology um, they're tools and all every tool can be used for almost any purpose, right? So despite the best of public intentions, we could say we put those out into private markets, and what we start to see is um, a financial landscape, um, like I said, the legacy of which we still experience, and this is one of many, many, many cities of which redlining maps were made, um, but who's, and it's not just the legacies of the built, envi in the built environment, we have legacies of those practices that are still felt, right? Um, the number of, we can think back just a few years ago to the last decade and think of the kinds of images of foreclosure, which are, you know, 21st century images of um, what follows after maps like these are made. I'm gonna stop there. It's very interesting and scary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, because I think that what I'm calling scary is the uncanny um, component that's erupting, at least for me internally, in hearing Leah's response to her map. And in a way, I like thinking about the map also as a parallel with the image. Um, and so I'm obvious. Well, it's not obvious yet, but the, the last, the next three images are all Gordon Mata Clark images. And someone who's a huge, who has had a huge influence on the way that I think about time, the way that I think about photography, the way that I think about space, the way that I think about sculpture. Um, and so I just kind of, I'm using his images in an honorary way, but also in a way to try to break down the way in which I think about the photographic image as an abstraction, which sounds, Strange, even even in its photojournalistic mode. Um, but I couldn't help but think, as Aaliyah was speaking as well, is what I didn't say in the first image, I will say now towards this image, is that there is an invisible, um, as much as the built environment shapes our movement in it, 
there are also, we live in America, which also had, and still has to a certain degree, invisible structures that um, we live within, whether, I mean, for the first image I would literally say segregation, and segregation followed itself. <laughs> it, it kind of flowed through into northern cities. So um, that image, you could maybe assume it was Memphis, but it's Philadelphia, right? And so Harlem, may, Harlem images for 1964 look quite similar. So what happens when we, when we interface, right? Um, when um, we kind of interface or somehow hit that invisible structure, there's a rupture. And I think um, that's, that's what's interesting to me also uh, in those images, because we still live with those invisible structures. We haven't dismantled them yet. Um, and so I um, wanted to also talk about photography as a structure, as a site, though that may, I'm um, asking you to kind of go with me on this journey. Um, and once you see that, then other things can happen with it. Um, and I definitely um, owe Guatemala Clark's work for helping me think through that as well. Um, because once his cuts um, are decontextualized, to me they operate in a photographic register. Um, they're abstracted, um, they are flattened, and the materiality speaks in different tones. Um, and one of those tones I want to say is silence. Um, and silence as a tone, um, I think is also quite interesting. So the, the speed in which the photojournalistic image operates, right? It kind of is, it's giving us the narrative, it's giving us perspectival space. We are entering into the window. Now that this is an object, um, Right, this like photo object, it's, it's stopping, it's slowing down, it's operating within a different um, speed. And so its speed speaks through um, change in materiality, change in um, surface. Um, I may be speaking like a painter right now, which I am not, but, um, but it's that kind of minutia that starts to speak. Um, speak of its former use, speak of multiple uses, um, it becomes a palimpsest in a way, um, a small monument. Um, and all of those things are interesting and fascinating to me um, as someone who I think works between um, modes, right? Spatial modes through, via the virtual, whether or not it's photographic or making a sculpture that kind of acts like a photograph. Um, but then also thinking about how our bodies interact with that, with that object. Um, so the cut in this instance um, to me is also, it puts pressure on the negative space. So even though this Bronx floor is decontextualized, it's an interior interior. So it's interior within an interior. And I like thinking about that as well. Um, this kind of magnifying of something that um, we ignore in its function, but somehow is activated through its um, disengaging of its func function. Um, and that's something that I think also plays into the way in which I think through material, two-dimensional material and trying to reverse it, trying to make it come um, to life, to have dimension. Um, so there's a quote that I would like to share. I'm at five minutes. Um, but I think it is helpful. <laughs> um, so it's uh, cultural, from cultural identity and cinematic representation. Um, uh, in discussing race, Stuart Hall argues that there are two kinds of identity, identity and being, which offers a sense of unity and commonality and identity as becoming or a process of identification which shows the discontinuity in and out of identity formation. Identity is important, but it is a process of imaginative rediscovery. And I really like that word for um, a portion of, I think, even this process of this talk and then also um, the way in which we are engaging with archival uh, data. Um, he argues against the idea of identity as true or essential, emphasizing instead 
the ways in which cultural identities are subject to the continuous play of history, culture, and power, that word again. Um, Kyle, can you change the image? So, um, I wanted to bring that up because I think um, I began with the first image stocked speaking about how it shaped my view of the world or shaped the way that I think about the world. And the only way I can engage with it is by somehow taking it apart. And that is a paralleling reality, I think, t um, that I share with admiring the work of um, Gordon Mara Clark and his Anna architecture, anarchy and architecture, um, thinking about what that could mean. Um, so this image is a uh, documentation of splitting um, his 1974 work um, of a home in New Jersey, which is then, um, I think many acts, almost of two dimensional acts, are um, acted upon this structure and penetrates it, opens it up. Um, and I see a parallel for me in how I also engaged with uh, the archive from the original um, project, Untitled Structures, which also sh frames collective stance, um, that in order to puncture um, something that seemingly is opaque, uh, you have to cut, you have to open it up, you have to explore through other means. And so there's something about um, the rigor of his, I think, performative gesture. And in my work, I, also, I think it, it happens in a different way, but um, almost kind of reconstructing or um, repositioning, but starting with this act is uh, crucial, um, this puncturing, this rupture. Um, I also think about this in terms of uh, the opacity um, right, so a wall is a divide, right? It um, separates, it uh, creates a demarcation. <laughs> and um, a line does that, um, also a frame. And so I love how his work um, just misbehaves on all levels. And it's very liberating. Um, and I think I take that liberation and transform it in the way that I do and work with history and work with historical material. Um, but hopefully also still leaving a trace of um, the referent or the struggle or the question, which I feel like when I engage with his works, um, I often think about as well. This may turn into a conversation. Oh, that's about to. Um, I'm gonna no. I'm gonna try to hold on. I'm, gonna, okay. I'm trying to hold on here, but there's so much. Um, so I'm gonna pick up on that though okay. and say, of the many things you just said, this notion that you know, in order you said in order to puncture the opaque, you have to cut, you have to open it up, um, and and various other descriptions of his sort of acts upon, um, in, in splitting especially, although I think it's true in the Bronx, um, in the Bronx Floors project as well. Um, <clears throat> this connection to drawing, right, and the fact that what becomes operative is like two-dimensionality, right? Like when you're, when you're acting within the world, within occupiable space, that, that the really operative um, important, impactful work tends to be those things that you could delineate or the opposite of, right, because you're, he's removing. Um, but that um, two-dimensionality or two-dimensional acts become enormously important um, when you can try to occupy them. And, and that's fascinating that you said all that because I have pulled this image, um, which is, uh, okay. Hold on. And I think largely that we can keep coming back to this, the importance of abstraction or acknowledging the importance of abstraction and the, the act, whether we intend it or not, um, that, that each image uh, is edited um, and is abstracted despite however 
journalistic it attempts to be. And so there's this, the sort of perspectival attempt at a map, the ornithographic, um, AKA bird's eye view, it should be funny, right? The ornithographic <laughs> um, perspective, uh, it, it's sort of the lie that's not a lie in many ways, right? It's attempting to give you that space to construct perspectival space for you from an impossible view that you, would, you will never see, or at least in uh, 1925 when it was drawn, most people would never see because flying was not that common. Um, and, and it, but it goes further than that, right? The, the sort of, um, it, it belies the abstraction and the editing and the fact that it is not journalism and that things have been removed and replaced and, and decisions have been made and um, what should be noted and documented and remembered as a result, right, has been chosen and prioritized and uh, predetermined by someone. Um, that this is, it's an image of a, of a, this is 50 years before the horrors, right? The Amityville horror. Um, so, but it, it's an image of a, of, a, of a place as it wants not only to be seen, but as it wants to be known and as it wants to be, uh, an image that wants to be propagated. Um, you have to keep in mind, this is the early 20th century and uh, you know, the suburbs around New York, just like New Jersey, right, um, are growing and uh, it's an image of what it wants to become, not just what it is and how it wants to be remembered. Um, and, and so with that perspective, that belying the abstraction that we all sort of acknowledge when we're dealing with the two-dimensional, um, it, it, it's producing a kind of, um, yeah, like I said, the lie that's not a lie. It's, uh, it's producing a, f a false snapshot of a moment that didn't exist that we could maybe pretend willfully, you know, voluntarily choose to, to remember despite the fact that it didn't happen um, out of a series of complex interrelated processes, right? So here in the suburbs, they're, they're rapidly growing. They're growing under certain conditions for certain, with certain new people, um, uh, they are predicated on certain, that growth is predicated on certain lifestyles, certain relationships to, you know, a major economic hub, um, and uh, are presenting, so they're, oh, the, they're presenting a legacy that's not yet a legacy. They're designing a legacy, right, that will be built upon um, and that will be reimagined and that will be reproduced and reconstructed over and over again. Um, and doing so through the image, in this case, like these images become, they're, they're, they're the opposite of the document of thing, documentation of something that happened. Rather, they're the tool to make that thing happen. last set. Um, so we're looking at a still frame, a screenshot actually, uh, from the Eames's Powers of Ten film. For those of you who don't know it, you must. You must. It's only nine minutes long and it is amazing. Um, it's from 1977. And if if I'm thinking about that, and it is a completely different take on understanding perspectival space, completely different way of representing and dis, um, dealing with scale, right? If the Amityville map is showing you, map, is showing you Amityville as a whole, and then, you know, along its edges, along the periphery of the, of the page, sort of zooming in on individual moments to tell you how great all of those are as well, um, uh, that the parts in the whole have you know, meaningful relationships that we understand as scale, right, as scalar relationships. Um, this, the Ames uh, film uh, speaks to those scalar relationships absolutely beautifully. Um, and it goes further in that, or the reason why it speaks to me um, is that if, 
if one, uh, if the previous image sort of, if you unpack it a little bit, it starts to describe this active choice toward what we will know and what we will remember and the world that we've decided we are making for ourselves and for others. And then, then that sort of implies the lives that we will be able to live, not just the ones we will live, but the ones we'll even have opportunities to live, that that is an active process um, of, of making memories, right? Um, then, and I'm, I'm gonna actually, the only quote I'm going to say today, I'm going to quote Leslie. And when she talks, uh, when, when she was talking to me about the process of, of a lot of the, conceiving a lot of the work um, that's in the show, uh, she spoke about this, uh, about seeing and looking as an active process. And we talked a lot about actively looking, not just actively constructing the image of the thing we think we see, and not just actively choosing what we will remember culturally, collectively, and what we will forget um, collectively, but that the, the act of looking itself is, is, um, is active. It takes volition, it takes choice, and, um, and the Powers of Ten film reminds me of that every time I watch it, right? If, okay, if you haven't seen it, you start on a blanket, at a picnic in a park in Chicago, you zoom out, 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 out. Each time zooming out and by another power of 10, you get far, far, far away in some other galaxy. Then you zo quickly zoom back in and then you zoom in on the, blan on the blanket and the people sitting and having their picnic uh, by powers of 10 until you can see every little microbe and you know the mitochondria within the cells even. And then probably I think atoms and within them, neutrons. Anyway, but that, that parts and wholes are not only related um, and that those relationships are operative, but that we have to choose what we're going to see. And we have to choose to look and, and make decisions about what we will see because at any moment in, if the film does anything, um, if it explains anything of all the things it explains, I would say first and foremost, it's that when you choose at what level you're going to look, you have to acknowledge all of the other levels you can't access at that moment. You know, that, that our experiences and, and the world in which we have them is layer, are all layered. Um, and at any moment, we are choosing actively what we'll see and knowing that if, I, if I'm at a certain Zoom level, right, um, there's, there's detail and resolution far beyond what I could perceive, and there's context far beyond the limits of my periphery and um, and that I guess the most we could potentially do is be responsible for knowing that even if we can't be responsible for realizing it or actualizing it and um, that's me ranting and raving about this the powers of ten. <laughs> um. Okay, so another uncanny moment is the year again. Um, so I didn't realize also that both of these image, both of these works are um, the same year, right? Yeah, 77, yeah. 1977. Not too far before we became sentient beings. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is still fascinating. Um, not to get too metaphysical, but I think it's fascinating. Um, so um, I chose the office, one of the images of the Office Baroque project um, that Gordon, Gordon Mata Clark did, but um, in Belgium in 1977, a five-story office building. Um, again, engaging with these cuts, um, but there's something about the combination of the sculptural drawing in space performed on this structure, but then this photograph, very specifically, um, I find uh, resonates greatly with me. Um, a word that was used by him that I just want to share was an arabesque. He um, often referred to these cuts um, as an arabesque, which I thought was quite interesting when you think about arabesque. It, it's an ornamental um, embellishment in a way uh, in Islamic art, um, if I could just reduce and say something in two words, but also that it refers to the body. It's corporeal, too, when we think about dance and arabesque as an extension. Um, and I love that combination because um, 
I think that's also what makes his work so beautiful, at least to me, and raw, is that it's a reminder that these structures are in, were inhabited, that um, you know, structures sometimes are built to keep out, also to keep in, um, and he's puncturing, creating a threshold, a transition, a, like a perpetual transitional space. That's interesting to me as an artist. Um, and I think this also connects to your deciding to share or point to something that we talked about, is that the act of looking is an active, right? It's an engagement. It's that, that space, that's a threshold between yourself and the object of your, your gaze or what it is that you're looking at. Um, and the fact that in this particular image that it's just always slightly out of reach um, because it keeps opening and opening and opening and opening, but at the same time it's similar so that it still brings this closeness, this kind of um, liminal space is, is very present. And um, I wanted to end with this image because if I started with an image that was very recognizable in a way, right? Um, it's what we expect of photography, it's what we expect of photojournalism. And I think I came into this world saying, I don't see everything. This image isn't saying everything, this image isn't speaking. Um, and the only way I could start to engage with that history or engage, somehow feel agency in the present tense that the past has over me <laughs> is by engaging in its representation, the representation of the past. And not with reverence, but also with, um, uh, we talked about like exploratory surgery in a way during our studio visit, right? Kind of exploring if the image is a site, the way that Gordon Mara Clark kind of the building is the site, the cut is the engagement, the cut is similar to um, the looking. And um, that's definitely what I responded to and what I think um, I attempt to do in the way in which I work, especially in um, the instance of the film work, but then also the sculptures in relation to the film work, the sculptures in relation to the lithos, that all of these are a set of engagements, a set of, a set, a set of cuts, excuse me, <laughs> um, and that they reverberate and work together, and they don't necessarily construct the whole, they uh, construct another um, part, another fragment, um, and that that's something that I think is uh, essential. Sorry, that four minute, his four minute uh, alarmed me. <laughs> um, but I also like that you ended with, or you responded to this image, because I sent my images first with a cinematic image, with a moving image, um, because I pretty much chose the relationship between photography and sculpture to grapple with history and memory um, and our relationship to history and memory, but then also to um, think about uh, how to bring history into the present. Um, and um, for my work in the show, um, how I did that was through engaging um, the moving image to refer to the, to the still image. Um, and it's uncanny and very bizarre, this kind of in and out that the um, powers of 10 operates because in working on the film, there were many instances where we're photographing or recording something that's not revealing itself to the 35 millimeter film camera, right? It's like we're in that rug, we're in the uh, materiality of the site that we were in, as, almost as if it could um, give us more, much more just through its opticality. Um, and so, though these are unrelated, <laughs> they are so related and in a way I think shape, at least for me, a liberation that I find in playing with images, engaging with images as structures um, that could be deconstructed and reconfigured. Um, and in a way, there's um, a new opticality that's created, if I could say that. Um, and sometimes it's uncomfortable, right? Like to see um, uh, Gordon Mato Clark's this image as uh, normative now, but not in its time, right? So it's like these, the when we start to manipulate and um, reconfigure in the optical uh, space, something else happens 
And I see that as a very generative uh, set of processes. And part of why I wanted to engage with you, so we're gonna move into, um, so this is for your pleasure, if you're interested to learn a little bit more about our images, but um, so thank you for the <laughs> thank you this this is fun for engaging with this this is a uh, bit uncanny yeah it's really... it's yeah it's it's shocking so um i have a few questions all right um prim primarily because of the way in which you work which um i think you revealed a little bit here but not um fully uh but you still work with maps as much as you kind of point to them and critique them, you know, we still construct maps, right? We still construct images. I guess I'm using maps as yeah. this kind of, you know, the way, I, I'll, I'll just say for me, right? Like I still construct images. As much as I'm critical of images and the way in which they operate, I still make them. So could you say a little bit about? About my own yeah. work. Mm -hmm. um, actually, there is an interesting parallel to your image. You're working with images and the making thereof and my dealings with maps. I am a cartographer and I make a lot of maps. And, I, and in those, with those works, if I think of each map as a project unto itself, it's made for a specific reason, for a specific audience, and I understand them as tools. I, and like the map is an instrument um, set out, like put out to do something um, with a specific agenda, because to pretend that it didn't have that would be I think would be irresponsible um, but I think but there's the other component of my work where um, a lot of my research a lot of my methodological research uh, the site of my methodological research is historic maps right so in the same way that there's sort of an active looking at an archive of images for you or leading to everything that's awesome over there. Um, the other side of this wall, I believe. It, I have, in the last few years, started actively looking at historic maps and historic documents and starting to reverse engineer those, right? So I use a lot of digital cartography tools and analysis, and digital and uh, cartographic analysis tools and a kind of, um, I call it digital archeology, span sort of reverse engineer the city that that map had abstracted or attempting to describe, knowing that there's always, there are always things that are left out. And if you look hard enough, you might be able to find what the hints of those um, phenomena or relationships or um, interactions or um, social landscapes. They're, they're sort of inscribed and embedded in the way that uh, cities are drawn and and they're hidden under the, those layers are in that document um, If you're able to find you, you know, you have to hunt, but you're able to find them um, I say those are those are the two largest map parts of my work um, Yeah So I wanted to share um, an aspect that happened and I think which started at least for me thinking more um, what I shared here was more so my relationship to the image and the historical image and how to engage with it. But once we left the image as a site and actually went to actual sites <laughs> um, for the piece on title structures we shot in Chicago, in Memphis, and in the Delta region of Arkansas. And all of that, we were led there through the kind of cutting into the original archive, kind of gave us this information, gave us, in a way, this um, map, <laughs> which we followed. And um, once we arrived at the sites, because I think a misreading of the film is that it is a reenactment, which it isn't. Um, and the subtlety of it is that um, the metadata of the work is in the positioning of the figures but the site specificity comes through the locations, which which we are which are unaltered. So the turquoise, turquoise wall is not constructed by us. That is found in essence, framed by the project, but found by us. 
But so many other things happened in the process that revealed so much. Um, the locations that we were shooting at um, were in transition from being functional to non-functional and potentially um, disappeared. And if there's a metaphor for the bodies that once also inhabited those spaces, they are also dislocated and dispersed and shifted. Um, and not to do like a full analysis of you know, what, what those cities um, have gone through, and we in New York City are also going through our own transformation. We are sitting in <laughs> the midst of mm -hmm. transformation via um, the sculpture center, surrounded by the high rises that were not here yeah. previously. Um, this, is not to, this is not to say I'm anti-change, but there was something that was so glaring once we left the, um, uh, I want to say maybe the metaphoric space right. of art in a way, Just right? The kind of closed system. Taking the words right out of my mouth. And then going into reality in a way that um, had us face it, um, face, the, the face history in the present, um, architecturally and structurally. I, I would, yes. Um, I know, so both of us are fans um, of metaphor, at least in language. Yes. Um, but I think what's so startling about that and, and interesting about that, that process of discovery and that process of making, um, and I think it, it, it's represented in all of the images that we both chose here, is that, um, that, the, that I, th I think there's a tendency for not us as individuals, but us as a whole, to sort of want to look at the environment, um, the built environment, as a metaphor for the things, uh, whether good or bad, that we're witnessing, and, pro and changes taking place, um, and you know that it might be clean and bright and hopeful and growing and gleaming and shining, or the exact opposite, right? But the truth is, um, but I, th I think we kind of want to treat what we see when we're out there in it, metaphorically, because it's easier, honestly, than acknowledging that it's not a metaphor. They're symptoms of the same processes, right? That growth is real. It's it's a uh, it's it's not just symptomatic. It's the outcome of structural conditions that have built manifestations as much as they have social manifestations, as much as they have um, in personal, in, in like individually personalized experiential manifestations. And uh, yeah, and I, I mean that's a difficult. It's a difficult tension because the other thing is, well, what I mean, there finding one's agency, one's active agency in that environment when, again, it's not just um, that those seemingly overwhelming and impenetrable structural conditions are right in front of you all the time uh, is very difficult, if not like impossible, to try to muster some level of active agency. Um, and so, you know, it is easier to think of it as a, as a metaphor for um, what we sense rather than uh, the, the product of what we're experiencing. Um, but that's the other thing I think is so great about our conversation right now and, and the sort of conversation by image leading up to, to tonight um, is, is an opportunity to sort of explore how being confronted with that, um, those, the, the image-based manifestations of those structures and the contextualized site-specific environmental manifestations of those structures, um, how that confrontation operates in our different disciplines. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna go. And I didn't say this earlier, but um, now that you just brought it up, the different disciplines, the inter interdisciplinary nature that I think, um, I don't wanna speak for you, but I'm often drawn to collaborate mm -hmm. because of um, my fascination with film, right. which I think is 100% responsible for the way in which I photograph the way that I photograph. And if there was a follow-up conversation, I would ideally love to do it with Brad publicly to talk about film as a, as a catalyst. 
But architecture, um, going to Cooper Union, having most of my meaningful memories of my peers were also through the architecture students under John Haydick's tenure at Cooper Union, right? So they were artists mm -hmm. kind of in and of themselves and he understood that and respected that, that, that um, label as well and honored it. Um, and so I really always search out and seek out these kinds of um, conversations and hopefully also that try to make work that can be intersectional um, and not that it creates a solution, but more so that it exposes. Um, yeah. So I'm the kind of architect that doesn't build buildings, um, right? Perfect. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's why I call myself an urbanist, um, more of a planner uh, than an architect probably. But, but as an urbanist, right, I, I, think, I think that you summarized from a different discipline, you know, my own commitment to um, collaboration, because at the end of the day, I study cities, um, which means I can't be a subject matter expert of all the things that cities create, because if there's one thing that defines a city, it's um, pluralism, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, that they are the place where all the crap happens. <laughs> and so, uh, just studying ways of understanding that means that you have to be constantly engaged in conversations with those who understand each of those different kinds of processes. What brings them together is that they are all urban, and they and and, and so it's really the relationship between them that I'm looking at. Um, but it also means, like the planner in me, sort of sort of thinks that um, being able to engage in discussions on how we represent space, mm -hmm. how we document space, how we um, engage and make images that will last, how we, how we edit our cultural memory of cities and, and certain spaces and moments that are um, important to our cultural legacies and, um, and cannot be detached from the location where they took place, how those images are decided and um, shared and then and reconfigured when necessary um, is, like I said, the, the urban planner in me sees that as part of the process of city making, because the other things that distinguishes cities is that they aren't about products, they're not about the city you will make. Um, urbanism is a process with no end. Um, cities never finished. <laughs> And so it's, it's, yeah, it's not that we would come up with solutions in this conversation, it's that urbanism, at least, you know, I'm coming at it as an urbanist, not as an artist, um, that urbanism requires that we have the conversation. That's it. So we're going to open it up to questions. Um, if you have a question, let me know. I'll ask you to speak into this mic since we're recording. Um, I asked you this before, and I'm still curious, even though I do feel that some of the things were touched upon in ways that um, before coming to this and hearing you speak about it prior to this, too, um, I'm still not there with you. Um, the things that I was really interested in when you talked about Garden Monte Clark. So you is me, Leslie. Yes, oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, I'm looking <laughs> at you, but I realize, yeah, <laughs> Leslie. Um, I'm just very curious about when you talk about um, engaging with image uh, as structures, where were you when you created these white structures in the center of the room? Like, what? what how did you engage those images with structure. Sure, um, though it's not as literal as you are desiring. Sure, no, sure, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious where your head I'll, is I'll, at with okay. that, yeah. <laughs> um, so I started this work, and I would say all of the work that falls within Collective Stance in 2010, which was an invitation, which began with an invitation to view, to look at an archive um, housed at the Manil Collection in Houston, Texas. Um, and at that time, um, it 
purely was just an invitation, and I was, and didn't understand at that point that it would become a project, um, but more so beginning it with resistance. Most of my work outside of what's here um, engages in the act of re-photography or kind of photographing other photographs and then constructing a photograph. Um, and I thought the invitation was based off of that, right? So the, the museum asking me to re reinvigorate their collection through my mode of making. And I initially resisted that. And my resistance didn't come with a no, I, I don't want to do any project, but more so uh, I want to look. And so the looking took, I would say, six months um, of returning to the archive, looking at the archive, having questions. It became very qu quick, it became um, apparent quickly that I needed to bring in my collaborator, Bradford Young, who's also, I think, obsessed with images that frame the world in which we live. Um, and so that process of kind of going through the archive um, was a collective one at that moment. Um, a year from there, from that point, we started scouting. Um, and as soon as we started scouting, I started to think about the form. And that form, I didn't know at that point would be a film. Um, and so I started to create structures in my studio, um, formally, like kind of reconfiguring. We also created collages that also came from looking. So these are all byproducts of just engaging with the archive. I didn't know at that point what would come out of the process of engaging that could hold as a work in and of itself. Um, what else was fascinating to me of um, embedded in this archive, which the earliest image is from the 40s, the latest is, was 1980. Um, so it kind of has this broad scope. Um, but the, the punctum, if you will, of the archive are these kind of iconic images that highly circulate. And I couldn't help but think about also other modes of making that come out of that same height, heightened period of the civil rights era through the art historical view. And to me, minimalism was also kind of very um, a strong, has strong affect at that particular moment. Um, so in a way that also shaped the way that I started to think about form and structure and materiality. Um, we, during this time, continuing also to scout. And while being in on location at particular um, sites that then revealed other things to us, um, I also did a series of lithographs, which are also here. So it's more so to isolate the, the objects, the sculptures, um, I think almost would be a disservice to the, the way in which I think, I hope also people experience the work. Um, they all come through me. So even though they seem unrelated, they relate in, in material terms, sometimes just formal. Um, so, you know, how to, some of the questions that came, became quite apparent once we were going to work on a film is how to make something two-dimensional experiential. Um, and I think we did that in a certain degree with the film itself. But what is that moment where something that's two-dimensional becomes three, right? Is it a subtle 90-degree shift? Is it a 45-degree shift? Is it when you turn and have a, another relationship, another perspective, that it becomes, its dimension opens. So these were a series of um, experimentations just in my studio, just thinking about how to transform this very, I think, maybe singular act for myself and Brad engaging with this archive, constructing um, these collages that then led to the film, the film then needing a form in this kind of perpendicular space being most appropriate for it for other reasons that have to do with peripheral vision and the periphery and kind of finding space in between. Then it made sense to then think about these structures again. Um, and so, they sit in the space, hopefully also echoing what one experiences in the black box, right? But then they also echo the white cube, but the white cube now reconfigured, right? Scaled down, human scale, <laughs> manipulated. Um, you also, uh, other peop as people walk, I often envision when people um, 
hopefully more than one person in the space, but there's <laughs> cuts that happen too. So as you are looking at someone else across the room, you know, someone's cut off at portrait level, right? And they become kind of flattened in a similar way too. So um, there's all of these things that I think are in the work. Um, and the only way that I could answer is just by sharing the process. I don't have a question, okay. I, I, and I don't want to speak for you. Okay, but, but <laughs> I also, I, and I now have a rereading okay. of yeah. I make maps of maps, and you take photographs of photographs, and now I'm gonna this say the stuff, say re say some things. Oh, I'm just because um, because you sharing that process started to reveal, I think, something that a word a word is coming to mind that we didn't say in the talking of those you know, four pairings of, of images. Um, but I think we've been talking around that's super important, um, and that's orientation, mm -hmm. right? That in speaking of the like more directly sculptural pieces, um, not just in, in matters of, of materiality and form, and we have talked about dimensionality um, and relationship to relationships to a viewer and constructed perspectives. And, and these have sort of come out in, in the different images and in discussing the work. Um, but those are all related but different to this question of orientation, which I see as enormously important, um, not just in the, in the film works, but clear ac across the um, exhibit, and that's cr across the exhibition. And, um, and I think it's, it's sort of underlaid, you know, like it, it's a, in addition to all of these other sort of um, imaged operations, image-based operations um, and concerns, how it has been this question of how we can understand the image uh, the images, any given image's orientation to both its maker and its viewer, um, and then and then how we might be able to exploit that orientation for further understanding, or mine it for greater meaning, or twist it or tweak it just enough to um, to start to reveal a little bit more, right? And I think I think if I'm hearing you correctly, it's like it's all coming together right now with this question of how we orient ourselves. Um, and you know, if that's a question of finding north, it never is a question of finding north. It's always a question of tri trilaterating or triangulating between known points, mm -hmm. and like just trying to get our bearings and find out what those known points is. Like, what do we know? Uh, I think that's something to be said in on any of the images, the maps, or the Gordon Mata Clarks, or um, the Philadelphia photograph. It all comes down to like answering this question, like. How do I get my bearings? Like, what do I know? What can I hold on to? And in order to locate myself, whether that's emotionally or historically or materially or financially or within a gallery. Any other questions or comments? No. <laughs> I think they want to ask questions over beer. <laughs> okay, no, that's that reasonable. <laughs> that was just such a great way to end it. I don't like <laughs> because you sort of oh, pulled so many to threads say. together in that last statement. It just it felt really complete in a way. Well, I just want to say one more thing while you're standing. Then go ahead. Before we, before we break go, break away. Yeah. Um, but this is also a prelude, I think, to a book that will that is forthcoming with Dancing Foxes, um, which Leah has agreed to participate in, um, because it became apparent once we engaged with this archive, this particular archive, it exploded in so many directions. And I think really the way, you know, the work as it, as it exists is one mode, and I think the book is also another way that kind of opens up and becomes more interdisciplinary and, it, and explores some of what we talked about today. So um, I just want to kind of put that out there that there's something in formation <laughs> that hopefully will be interesting and generational. In, I want to point that in out. In hyphen formation. Yes, and generational. Because I think that's, yeah. it's, it's very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel. Yes, yeah. agreed.
Thank you, Leslie. Well, thank you all for coming. I think, um, yes, people maybe would like to have a more casual conversation. Um, we, the shows will remain up for a little bit, and there's beer and water and things outside. And we welcome you to stick around for a few minutes and hang out. Thanks. <laughs>